I have a question for you as we begin this evening. What is your favorite story? We love stories. They're a key part of our society, key part of our culture, and a key part of our history. And when I asked you the question, what is your favorite story, no doubt one or many different things came to mind. I have so many favorite stories, it'd be hard for me to nail down a top three, to be honest with you. But we love stories. There's different kinds of stories. Love stories, action adventure stories, stories with high stakes and big chances. But we love a good story. And if you don't believe me, you can look to Hollywood for proof. Millions and billions of dollars have been made in telling stories. Movies, books, TV shows, all different kinds of ways. But there's proof where the money is. We love stories. Many great stories have been told through the years. All of them have had elements that we love. The element of love, drama, action, emotion, happy endings, and even sometimes sad endings. All of these play into what makes a great story. But the story we're interested in tonight is much older than a lot of these stories, and it has had more impact on history than all of these stories combined. It's the story of Jesus. This summer, we're going to be talking about the theme phrase, Sing Me a Song About Jesus. You know, song has been used throughout the years to tell stories. Most songs, at their base level, are telling a story of some kind. And tonight, the story of Jesus. The story of Jesus is an amazing story for one simple reason above all others. You see, most stories that we hear are fiction. They're not real. They didn't happen. They just came out of somebody's mind. But the story of Jesus is 100% true. Now, we could approach this story from a lot of different angles. And when I was first given this topic, I asked Dad, Okay, where do you want me to go with this? And he said, It's up to you. <laughs> that might have been his first mistake. But... I know throughout the summer, we're going to enjoy listening to lots of different speakers look at the story of Jesus from many different angles, and we're going to enjoy hearing their insights. But I want to talk about tonight the fact that all good stories have themes. All good stories have themes. Think about any story, doesn't matter what. Your favorite story, maybe. It could be a movie series, a book series, doesn't matter. Now, throughout that entire series, or out that entire series of events, if you will, if you look closely, you're going to find that there are major themes running throughout. Things that time and time again come into play and have a major role in not only the process of the story, but in the end result that the story has. There's different kinds of themes. A common one is the theme of good versus evil. Maybe the theme of finding oneself, the coming-of-age story, if you will. The theme surrounding a conflict. Well, tonight, I want to talk about three key themes in the story of Jesus. These three themes are, in my opinion, the three most important and key themes in the story of Jesus. And tonight, I just hope to build a foundation a few, put a few things into your mind where as we listen to these lessons throughout the summer, you can remember these themes and hopefully be able to gain more from the other lessons because of this one. So three themes, let's go ahead and get started with the first one. The first theme that I want to talk about tonight in the story of Jesus is that the story of Jesus is a story of active and intentional service. The story of active and intentional service. We know Jesus to be the servant king. That's the title of the series that Dad's been doing on Sunday nights in the book of Mark. And this isn't just, you know, a nice title to put on a sermon series. It's the truth. Jesus, no matter what he was doing or where he went or who he was with, he was serving. And we can see that in many ways throughout his ministry. If you would... Open your Bible with me, and let's go look in Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, we see a familiar account where Jesus serves 
a group of people. Matthew chapter 14, we're going to begin reading in verse number 15 with the familiar account of the feeding of the 5,000. Now we're going to be, I'm just going to warn you, we're going to be doing quite a bit of reading tonight from the Gospels because what better way to tell the story of Jesus than to let him speak for himself? So beginning in verse 15, let's look at this time where Jesus served these people. It says, When it was evening, his disciples came to him, saying, This is a deserted place, and the hour is already late. Send the multitudes away, that they may go into the villages and buy themselves food. But Jesus said to them, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, We have here only five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke and gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. So they all ate and were filled, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments that remained. Now those who had eaten were about five thousand men besides women and children. What an amazing account of service. This is an important account. If it wasn't, it wouldn't be in all four Gospels. As we know, this is the only miracle that is recorded in all four Gospels, found here in Matthew 14, as well as Mark 6, Luke 9, and John 6. And I want to notice something that maybe we overlook from time to time about this account. See, Jesus had a mind about him to serve. In all circumstances, Jesus was looking to serve. The apostles, on the other hand, well, we might act like them a little more often. See, what are the apostles thinking here? They go to Jesus and they say, Listen, Lord, we're out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, we came out here because there's a lot of people, couldn't really fit in the town, so we came out here, but hey, it's late. It's dinner time. It's time to eat. I can appreciate that. Lord, we got to send these people away. They got to go get some food. See, the apostles, they're thinking, all right, there's all these people, and well, somebody's got to feed them. So let's just let them take care of themselves, send them away. They'll, they'll, they'll take care of themselves. They know where to get food. They'll be fine. But Jesus says, wait a minute, guys. We don't have to send them away. We can serve them. Sure, they might be able to take care of themselves. We could send them into town, and they could get their own food. But this is an opportunity to serve. This is an opportunity for us to take care of them. And Jesus tells them, hey, you serve them. And we see that even after he produces the food miraculously from just the five loaves and two fish, he gives it to the disciples so that the disciples can give it to the people. See, Jesus, he's teaching them to be servants. The feeding of the 5,000 is very familiar to us. But you may or may not be aware of the fact that this is not the only time in Jesus' ministry that he does something like this. In fact, let's turn over just one page in my Bible to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, we see the account where Jesus feeds the 4,000. Now, for one reason or another, we tend to sometimes overlook this particular account probably because 4,000 is not quite as impressive a number as five. I guess we can appreciate that. But the point is, it's a lot of people. And it's very similar to the other account of the feeding of the 5,000. But if you would, read with me beginning in verse 32 of Matthew chapter 15, where it says, Now Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, I have compassion on the multitude, because they have now continued with me three days, and have had nothing to eat. And I do not want to send them away hungry, lest they faint on the way. Then his disciples said to him, Where, where could we get enough bread in the wilderness to fill such a great multitude? Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven, and a few little fish. So he commanded the multitudes to sit on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and the fish, and gave thanks, broke them, and gave them to his disciples. And the disciples gave them to the multitudes, so that all ate and were filled. And they took up seven large baskets full of fragments that were left. I want you to notice a few key differences between the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. First off, 
In the feeding of the 5,000, we see that the apostles go to Jesus and they say, hey, these people need food. But in this account, we see Jesus calls the disciples to him and tells them, hey, these people need food. It's just an interesting note. Now, I don't know about you, but there are times in Scripture where I read about a certain group of people or person, and they do something that I just, I cannot seem to understand. They just do something so ridiculous that I think, how in the world could you, how, how could you be this crazy, if you will? And that's kind of what the apostles are doing for me here. They, Jesus brings them to him and says, we need to feed these people. And what's the apostles' response? Where are we going to get the food for that? Guys, we don't know how long it is between these two accounts, but, I mean, it's reasonable to assume. It's probably not that far apart. Apostles, guys, you've been with Jesus for who knows how long now, and could have been a few days ago, a few weeks ago, a few months, a year. It doesn't really matter. You've seen Jesus feed 5,000 people with five bread loaves and two fish. And now you're with Jesus in a similar situation, and he's saying, hey, we got to feed these 4,000 people. And you're like, I don't know where we're going to get the bread for that. Really? Come on, guys. And it's also interesting to note, they have more bread in this situation than they did last time. They've got two extra loaves. Not that that really matters with Jesus. It could have been one loaf, and it wouldn't have made a difference. But I don't know. The apostles, they just... They get me sometimes, you know, like the children of Israel in the Old Testament. You just you scratch your head on occasion. But I want you, what I want you to notice about this particular account, what I want you to remember is that Jesus kept serving. See, Jesus fed the 5,000 in a miraculous way, and it was incredible. And now here he has this other opportunity to do a similar miracle. And you know what he could have said? He could have said, well... I've already fed the 5,000, you know, I've, I've checked that box, so this time we'll just send them away and they'll be fine on their own. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus says, here's a need, and though I might have filled it before, here I have the opportunity to take care of it again. And so he does. Sometimes we fall into the trap of saying, oh, well, I've done that before. We have an opportunity to serve, and maybe the first time we take it, but then it comes about again. And we say, well, let's let somebody else handle it this time, because well, I've already done that. That's not the example Jesus gives us here. Jesus shows us that when the opportunity to serve arises, it doesn't matter if we've done it before or not. We need to take it. And another important thing from this particular account is, don't be like the apostles in this case. Don't doubt Jesus. You see, while we are not blessed in the same way the apostles were, to where Jesus walks with us physically every day, Jesus is still with us as Christians. He promises us in Matthew 28 that he'll be with us always, even to the end of the age. So we should not doubt Jesus. See, when we look for an opportunity to serve, when we have been given an opportunity to serve, sometimes we may think, well, that's a little too big. That's a little too ambitious. I'm not sure if we can accomplish that. Ladies and gentlemen, with Jesus, all things are possible. We should not limit ourselves, nor should we limit God, especially when it comes to serving. But Jesus didn't just give people food. That's not the only way in which he served. I would say the most prevalent way in which we see Jesus serve during his ministry is when he healed people. And he healed people from multitudes of different physical diseases. He cast out demons. And he was able to help people in a miraculous way that we may not be able to today, but we can see the necessity of service through this. Now, I want you to understand that healing people was not just a pastime for Jesus, okay? This wasn't a weekend hobby. This was something that he was constantly doing, and I mean all the time. I took the time to count, and I'm not a numbers person, so I could be off with this, but if my math is correct, one-third of all chapters across the four Gospels have at least one miracle of Jesus in them. Over a third. 
Just a list for you, and I'll make this quick. If you are looking for a miracle of Jesus, you can find one in Matthew 4, 8, 9, 12, 14, 15, 17, and 20, Mark 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, Luke 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 14, 17, 18, and 22, John 4, 5, 9, and 11. That's a lot of miracles, ladies and gentlemen. Jesus was serving constantly, all the time. And John chapter 20, verse 30 tells us Jesus did many miracles that aren't even recorded. He did many miracles that aren't recorded, but the ones that he did do are so that we could believe. Jesus was a constant servant. But we might now be thinking, well, these are, these are great. These are acts of service. I can do these, but they're kind of for the outside people. See, Jesus wasn't really serving his people, per se, he was serving the world. Service does not just go to those outside the church. You also must serve those inside. Turn with me to John chapter 13, where we can see an incredible example of Jesus serving those whom he loved. John chapter 13, begin reading with me in verse number 3. Where it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. Now, we've heard, if you're like me, you've heard a multitude of lessons on this, so I'll keep it somewhat brief. But here's what you need to understand about this account. First off, this job was customary in this particular culture. Washing of the feet was something that was normally done when you entered a home, because at this time, most didn't have any shoes at all. If they did, it just would have been sandals. So your feet got pretty dirty walking on the dusty roads. Now, I don't know about you, but this is not the most appealing job in my opinion. So it was often given to the lowest servant. Understand, this should have already been done. We see that in verse 2 it says, supper being ended. So they've been in the house for quite some time now. See, this should have already been taken care of. But even though it was a job that should have already been done and should have been done by the lowest servant, we see Jesus do it. Jesus, the king of the universe, stoops down and does the lowest task because simply, well, no one else had done it. Jesus saw a need and he took care of it. I want you to realize the variety of ways in which Jesus served. See, we sometimes limit ourselves in the ways which we think that we can serve. But we need to follow the example of Jesus and serve in all the ways that we can. And sometimes understand that service requires us to get outside our comfort zone. If all you do your entire life is serve in ways you are comfortable with, you will not have served to the extent which you could. So we need to understand that sometimes service is going to be uncomfortable. So active intentional service, it's a theme of the story of Jesus. And I'm not making great time here, so we're going to speed up a little bit. The second theme goes hand in hand with the first, and they are inseparable. The second theme is that the story of Jesus is characterized by painful and costly sacrifice. So we have service, and we have sacrifice. What is sacrifice? Now, I didn't look this definition up in a dictionary, and I didn't get it from a Greek lexicon. This is simply the definition of what I think of when I think of biblical sacrifice. Sacrifice is giving up or letting go of something that is important or significant to you for the benefit of someone else. Think about all the ways in which Jesus sacrificed. I mean, we can think of some of the big ones. We think about them all the time. But there's a lot of little ways, they're not little, but maybe less significant ways in which Jesus sacrificed that we often overlook. Consider the fact that Jesus left heaven for us. Heaven being a perfect place. A place where there is no sin, no sorrow, no pain, no death. None of it. It's a perfect place. And that's where Jesus was before he came to earth. But Jesus knowingly left heaven and came to earth for us. And he knew what he was going to find here. He knew where he was going. And yet he left anyway. 
That's sacrifice. Think about also the fact that Jesus sacrificed his immunity, if you will, to temptation for us. See, Jesus being God, God cannot be tempted, right? Well, when Jesus took on flesh, became 100% man along with 100% God, he made himself vulnerable, if you will, to the temptation of the devil. Jesus, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15 tells us that we have a high priest who understands our pain. Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, yet without sin. Jesus suffered temptation on our behalf. Now, we often overlook this, and I think it's for one simple reason. Jesus never sinned. And so we often think that, well, temptation probably wasn't that hard for Jesus. Well, if he never sinned, if he never gave in, it must have been a breeze for him. I mean, he was God after all. Now, I'm not going to be so bold as to say, well, Jesus probably came close to sinning. I'm not going to say that. But what I will say is, Jesus understands temptation. I don't know about you, but I have a good feeling you probably think a little bit like me on this matter. Temptation is hard. It's hard. We all have ways in which we are weak. That's just part of being human. There are sins that tempt you more than they may tempt me, and vice versa. We have to understand that temptation is difficult. And Jesus went through that difficulty. He went through that pain of temptation on our behalf. He sacrificed for us. Jesus also, he, he suffered terrible mental and emotional pain on our behalf. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26, and we'll begin reading in verse 36. Matthew 26, beginning in verse 36, where it says, Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again a second time he went away and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. We often think of this passage and consider the fact that Jesus was going through almost an unimaginable level of mental anguish here. But Jesus even tells them in verse 38, My soul is sorrowful even to death. Jesus is suffering great emotional pain and distress at this time. And you see, he's with his best friends, so you think, well, that's got to make it a little better at least. They don't even understand what's going on. They don't understand what's about to happen, and so they say, hey, it's late at night, might as well go to sleep, take a little rest. Jesus, in this moment, in reality, feels completely and totally alone. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. God was still with him, right? Of course. God is with us as long as we are following him. And no doubt, God was with Jesus at this time, but if you've ever been at a point in life where you feel pretty low, where you feel this great kind of emotional pain, you can understand that there's a difference between knowing that God is with you and with being able to fully appreciate that. See, Jesus at this time feels completely alone. 
And yet, even in that state, he is able to sacrifice what he wants so that we can have a blessing. This is an incredible prayer from the mouth of our Lord, where he says, God, if there is any other way, if there's a plan B, a plan C, I don't care if it's a plan Z, if there's any other way, let's do it that way. But, not my will, but yours be done. Jesus sacrificed a lot for us. And then, of course, we see in Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, and John 19, that Jesus, his ultimate sacrifice was that of his life for us. Jesus suffered a terrible death on our behalf. He was abandoned by all of his friends. He was mocked. He was scourged. And he was killed. And understand that this, this is unimaginable pain. Now, I'm sure in, a, in an audience this size, there's probably some people in here who say, yeah, it's unimaginable pain. I don't know. I've been through quite a bit of pain myself. I don't want to be insensitive to that fact. I'm sure there's some people in here who have experienced a good amount of pain. I've been a patient in the emergency room eight times in my life, so I'd say I've experienced a fair amount of pain myself. But listen, it doesn't matter what level of pain you may have experienced. You've not experienced anything close to this. You see, Jesus was experiencing such an unimaginable level of pain for an extended period of time. Listen, Rome was really good at what they did. Crucifixion was a horrible thing, but they had it down to a science. Most people didn't make it to the cross. Most of them died after they got scourged, or as they were going to wherever it was they were going to be crucified, or as they were driving the nails in. Most people didn't make it to the cross, but Jesus he endured all of that pain for hours on end. Not because he had to or because he wanted to. He did it because he sacrificed for us. We remember this sacrifice every Sunday in the Lord's Supper, as we should. Because it is, was, and forever will be, till time ends, the most costly and significant sacrifice in all of history. The story of Jesus is the story of sacrifice. But finally, the last theme I want to look at this evening with you, the story of Jesus is the story of unending and undeserved love. This is the theme that ties it all together. The service and the sacrifice, they wouldn't have happened without the love. The Father sent Jesus out of love, John 3, 16, one of the most well-known verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world, not the sphere we live on, but the people, that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him may not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves us, and he proved it, even though we didn't have to. But this decision was not made exclusively by the Father. The Father didn't say, go, and Jesus said, well, I really don't want to, but I guess I will. Jesus came because he loves us, and he tells us that he loves us. Turn with me, if you would, to John 13. This is in the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. He's with his apostles in the upper room, and he's telling them, a lot of things. He's giving them a lot of information before he dies so that they can be ready for what comes next. But I want you to notice that over and over again, he tells them one thing. First, we see it in John chapter 13 and verse 34, where Jesus says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Turn over just another page to John chapter 15. John chapter 15, in verse 9, he says, As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. 
And then down in verse 12 of the same chapter, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is making it clear. He's telling them over and over, Love one another because I loved you. And they're about to see the fulfillment of that love. If Jesus didn't love us, he would not have come. If Jesus did not love us, he would not have served. If Jesus did not love us, he would not have sacrificed. The love of Jesus is so incredible that he did all of these things for us because he loved us. I want you to understand, we don't deserve this love. But by the grace of God, we have it. We need to be in awe of the love of God. In the long ago, in the Old Testament, David said in Psalms chapter 8 and verse 4, What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Now David lived before Jesus. He understood that there would be one day a Messiah, but he did not understand fully what that meant. David, even before this amazing act of love and sacrifice, was able to say, God, we're just, we're that big. Why do you care about us? It's because he loves us. The love of God is so amazing and so perfect, and we are unworthy of it. But we have it anyway. And what a wonderful, amazing thing to know that that truly is. You see, we deserved to pay for our own sins. But Jesus paid for us. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my Lord, would die for me? That's the line of one of my favorite songs. Stick around afterward with the family singing. We might just sing it. Amazing love, how can it be? But listen, we have these themes now. We have this understanding that Jesus was a servant, Jesus sacrificed, and Jesus loved us. That's a good thing to know. But what does it mean? I mean, what can we truly do about it? What application can we make now that we have this knowledge? Well, the first thing is we have to serve like Jesus. Jesus' service, as we've already stated, was intentional and it was active. You see, Jesus did not wait for people to come to him. Jesus went to the people. Turn with me once again to John chapter 13. We'll look briefly at the washing of the feet again. Beginning in verse 1, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas' chariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Understand, Jesus knew who he was. He knew the authority and power that he possessed. He knew what he was about to go through, and in spite of all that, he washed these men's feet. Jesus shows us here a guide to what Christ-like service looks like. I might turn this into a sermon one day, but for now, I'll give you the quick three bullet points of what Christ-like service looks like. First, in verse 4, Jesus rose from the table. He took action. The first step in serving like Christ is to take action. Two, verses 4 and 5, he prepared. He girded himself with the towel. He poured the water into the basin. We're not going to ever be able to serve effectively if we do not prepare to serve. And then, number three, just do it. Verse 5, we see he washes their feet. He could have got up from the table, he could have prepared, but if he hadn't actually done it, it would not have made a difference. We need to serve like Christ. Second application, we need to sacrifice like Christ, and we need to sacrifice for Christ. 
See, the first century Christians understood this at a level with which we cannot. They sacrificed their lives. A lot of cases, they literally sacrificed their lives for Jesus. They died because they were Christians. And while we will not be called in all likelihood to die a physical death for Christ, we need to be willing and prepared to sacrifice everything for the cause of Christ. I once, or excuse me, it reminds me of the verse where Jesus asks, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? We have to be willing to give up the whole world in order to sacrifice for Christ. And finally, we have to love God and we have to love each other. It's pretty simple, but that's the application. Jesus loved us and he gave so much for us. We ought also to follow his instruction and love one another. The story of Jesus is a story that is amazing. It's a story of sacrifice, a story of service, and a story of love. And it's a story that we need to tell every day. We need to tell it in how we live. We need to tell it in how we act. And we certainly need to tell it with our mouths. There's an old quote that you've probably heard. Preach the gospel, and if you must, use words. And that's a quote that we all need to live by. We need to make connections with people and make a difference in their lives, not because of who we are, but because of who Christ is. Now, I'll give you a little a teaser, if you will, for the invitation. The story of Jesus is an amazing story, but the story is not over yet. Thank you for your time.